Hello, friends, and a warm welcome to TVN Meets. My guest today is one of the most inspiring women of God that I've ever met, one who sold everything that she had for the sake of going full-time into ministry to focus on relief work wherever the need is or was in Africa. Now, listen, if that is not following Jesus in the true sense of what the Word says, then I don't know what is. And Pretorius, together with the late husband, Peter, founded Jesus Alive Ministries and Joint Aid Management, which is called JAM, in 1984. JAM is an African-founded and headquartered Christian International Humanitarian Relief and Development Organization currently operating in Angola, Mozambique, Rwanda, South Africa, South Sudan, Uganda, and Sierra Leone. Since its inception, JAM has progressed as an organization that reflects strong, expansive development. For more than three decades, it has grown into an organization that affects sustainable change through providing programs to children who need support and communities that need help. Serving Africa is what they do, irrespective of race, religion, gender, or political persuasion. That is JAM. And warm welcome to you. Thank you so much. It's wonderful <laughs> to be with you. Listen, JAM has done some amazing work over the years and um, it's available on your website if people ever want to see um, but now here's the crazy story so so peter your late husband right mm -hmm. he was a tobacco farmer That's right. when he got called yeah, yeah is that we when were, you met him we were farming tobacco yeah before we were married before that and then we relocated down to the nail spate area and that's where we we were sugar farmers and tobacco farmers. Sugar farmers and tobacco farmers. Yeah. Was it okay being a Christian farming? <laughs> we weren't. We weren't Christians. Oh, okay. We were converted on the farm. That's where we got saved. Oh wow! Saved. How did that happen? Peter's father had a double heart attack and he was dying. Yeah. And we didn't want to know anything about religion or Jesus or the church. That was just not part of our agenda. We were busy manufacturing a lot of income from our tobacco farming and whatever. And Peter was hoping for an early retirement in the bush. He loves the wow. bush and the wildlife. But this interception came like a Damascus Road experience. Mm -hmm. And it turned our lives around altogether. Wow. So, I mean, within weeks, Peter was an evangelist. He started preaching to the workers who worked on our tobacco farm. Amazing. And we, he cleared one of the tobacco barns and told them we're going to have church here on Sunday. Amazing. <laughs> so we started a little tobacco church. And, and that's seen, how it all began. And I've seen that fire throughout, you know, like yeah. the times that I've seen um, Peter preaching, um, you know, he's quite passionate. Very and you much can, so. you know, like a new convert. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> As he used to be a tobacco farmer. So that's always been really, really amazing. But I think, you know, um, you guys then decided to just give up everything mm -hmm. for ministry. Mm -hmm. That's bold. Well, that was God's instruction. That doesn't mean it was easy. That was God's instruction. And I argued with God. I said, We've got six children. Mm, and, mm. He, and instantly he gave me a picture of a mass of people. And as far as I could see, there were just people. And he said to me, this is the number of mission called people's children that I'm wow. looking after. And I thought, oh, why am I worrying about my six if this is what God's doing? So in every step that we walked, we had to see and be reminded of the greatness of our God. Mm. And sometimes we let that fire go out. We let that flame just get very weak in us. But that power of God within us when we get saved is such a powerful flame and such a fire that we can never let it go out. We've got to feed that fire and we've got to focus on that we magnify the Lord to see the bigness of God. Mm. Mm. Because it's only God that's enabled us to do what we've been able to that's do. Right. And we feel we could have done more. But wow. the way forward is definitely for expansion. You yourself kind of gave up a lot. I mean, you're a city girl. Mm -hmm. um, even <laughs> just to go from there into the farm. Love is a crazy thing. It is a and crazy thing. It's amazing crazy what you things, can do. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but I still think, you know, uh, leaving obviously everything, everything behind, because now you had six children. Yeah. That's a lot of children. Yeah. I, I mean, I don't know. It, it, <laughs> to me, it's a lot of children. I only have two, you know. But to leave that and to say, okay, cool, God is calling us into into missionary work. Yeah. How was it? How was it for you adapting to that sort of lifestyle? Now, it, you know what? I can't pretend it was easy because it wasn't. It was a massive change. My concern always was about my children. My children need to see a God who's a good God, mm. not a God who's caused us to have to change a lifestyle of suffer to to one of suffering. And our furniture became threadbare and we didn't have any excess. 
And it was a time of sowing before the reaping started to come. And it wasn't a quick one. But you know what? What happened in the children was actually a good, strong foundation that wow. we together as a family needed to trust God. And when I look back now, I see how strongly committed they are wow. to seeing and knowing the hand of God, even in lean times, not just in the blessed times. Wow. And we're talking about this earlier on, which is contentment. Absolutely. You know, which is, be, which is to be okay in the lean times, mm -hmm. to be okay um, in, the, in the blessed times. Was that the beginning of Jam? How did Jam, so, I mean, like, so did you and Peter say, okay, cool, now we're going to start Jesus Alive Ministries, which, which is what it was called at the time. That's right. So, so how did it get to that? Because 1984, it Well, says, 1983, Peter went into Mozambique, and we were already involved with the gospel, doing our Jesus Alive outreaches, mm -hmm. and we're still doing them. We're still doing outreaches in prisons, in villages. We've got a fantastic program with Jesus Alive, an amazing team who are doing it. But on the other side, when Peter went into Mozambique, he understood he was going in to preach the gospel. And they told him it's forbidden. We are Marx under Marxist rule. There's no way that you can preach the gospel here, only within the church. So uh -huh. we continued to do exactly that. But then he asked the government, what else do you need? And they said, we'll take you up to one of our feeding areas because we're in terrible drought and the needs in our country are massive. And they took him to a place called Pambara, Mm -hmm. up in the Vilanculos area of Mozambique. And he went to this camp. Well, they called it a feeding camp, but there was no food. Mm. And there were children wandering about around the dead bodies of their parents. Mm. They had nowhere to go. They didn't know what to do. The parents had sacrificed their last so that their children could live. And, and Peter was confronted with this. The pilot who flew him up left him there and had intended to come back, but he never came back for 10 days. Peter didn't know the reason. There was no communication. And it was actually because there was no fuel for the airplane to come back and get him. So he lived under bushes with the people for 10 days and helped to bury those because he was stronger than most. Mm. And, and mm. through that whole process, he screamed out to God one day saying, God, do you understand this? Do you see the suffering? How can you have this happen? And God said to him, my heart is broken just like yours. Mm. Do what you can do and I'll be with you. And those words have stayed with us from that day. Do what you can do and I'll be with you. Wow. And that's the truth of the matter. When God gives us something to do, we need to know that we can do what we can do, but trust God to do the extra and to provide and to go before us, over us in covering, under us, undergirding us, mm. being behind us as our rear God, because that's the God that we serve. So, yeah, that's how we started with the relief work. We started with an orphanage for those children in that area. And so the work grew and expanded. And we then started school feeding, where we intervened on the nutritional needs of the children with education in the schools. Mm -hmm. So that's how that started. And then we expanded into other countries, into Rwanda when the genocide started in 1994. Wow. So, yeah, there's been a lot of heartache and a lot of difficulty through those times. But God has truly been with us. I'm just thinking about the boldness, right? I was saying, okay, cool. There's a, there's a genocide in Rwanda. Because mm. um, there was a massive moment. And, yeah. you know, a lot, of, a lot of us in my generation kind of heard, uh, you know, heard about the genocide after the fact. And I think yeah. even the world was, um, was alerted of the genocide. Because it, I, I think if people knew, they would have tried to do something about it. Um, and, and also a lot of the programs that you guys do in these countries, um, you, you know, in Africa, um, kind of do come to us like after the fact a lot of the times. Yeah. Um, how, do you, um, how, do you, how do you respond to it so quickly? And how do you then get um, the resources to be able to go in there and to do what it is that you do? You know, I think one of the biggest factors is that we as Christians so often look for what God's hands can provide. His hand of provision, mm. his hand of protection, his hand of whatever it is. But if we'll go a little bit deeper, we won't seek just his hands, we'll seek his heart. And in knowing the heart of God, we hear of something like that. You hear of a disaster and immediately your heart is torn saying, what can we do? How can we help? And that's the drive, that's the boldness. So, I mean, with Rwanda, Peter immediately started trying to source some funding to go in and help. 
when he went into Rwanda initially, there were still dead bodies floating in the waters. Mm. The, the, the place was deserted. I was back at HQ and communicating to try and get permissions and everything that you need because we've got to follow pr procedures mm. and regulations. And sometimes those can put people off. There are a lot of people who say, well, I want to help, but the authorities are not helping me to help. So if they don't cooperate, how can we help? You know what? We have to honor the authorities because that's what the Bible yes. says. Yes. And trust God that he'll open the doors. So that's how we started in, in helping the displaced children in Rwanda. Many of them had fled to Goma um, in the DRC. Of course. And, and we then started out just helping the children, working with the local people. And we had widows taking care of the orphans. And we were able to make bricks wow. and build an orphanage that housed 700 children. But better than that, we were able to relocate over 12,000 children who were displaced through that project. Mm. So some of them are on Facebook with me today mm, and mm. they call me Mama Jam. And it's just because <laughs> our hearts went ahead of us. But it was the heart of God that was driving us to help the people. Amen. Let's speak about the volunteers, because I'm sure that there are many people who um, who come and they become a part of, you know, um, they become a part of what you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, you know, it's the vision, it's something, something that they wanted to do. Um, how How do people get involved, especially from you know, like from that front? Well, people can just contact us through our website and let us know that they're interested. And then we go through the process of application to vet yeah. the volunteers, check on their skills, see where they could help us best. And at the moment, we're wanting to really build a large volunteer base so that we've got people we can call on immediately mm. that are available to go in and assist when mm. there is a crisis. Mm. For example, the crisis in Byra recently with yes. that terrible cyclone. Yes. Um, it, it's just so good to have extra hands and feet. Mm. And I think for the volunteers themselves, sometimes it's a reality check for them, but sometimes it's also quite a shocking experience and they need to be people who are prepared for it. Of course. People who can handle that no, because the field's course, yeah. not easy. I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, and we've been playing a video um, uh, just over the past two days, just a two minute clip that you guys did for us um, um, so that our partners and just our viewers could actually see the great work that you're doing. And we're gonna be playing that out just throughout the week and maybe for the next two weeks because the disaster is still there and we're calling on people to, um, you know, to partner with us, to partner with JAM um, so that we can do something really, really, mm -hmm. you know, like really, really magnificent. What exactly, um, and, and, and I think still, we're not seeing enough of I me mean, like of what's happening that side. And that's why yeah. we thought we'll just bring the story as much as, you know, like as much as we possibly can so people can see the need mm -hmm. and uh, to also see um, what you guys are doing there. So just once again to my question, what I mean, like what exactly has been I mean, like happened in Mozambique for those who are hearing about this for the first time? It's OK if you're hearing for the first time. Yeah. And um, and what sort of relief are you guys providing? Well, the cyclone wiped out an enormous area. They estimate the area was the size of Luxembourg that was wow. underwater, that was devastated because of the cyclone. And fortunately, we're on the ground in Byra. We have a food factory there, mm -hmm. a big warehouse there. And so we were able to mobilize and, and retrieve the food that wasn't damaged because we sustained quite a lot of damage to our facilities there. Mm -hmm. And we were able to distribute food right from day one. But of course, wow. it didn't go very far. That was about 22 tons. Uh, so that wasn't very much food. But we work in cooperation with the other humanitarian organizations. And we were able to work with World Food Program on this mm, one. Mm, and mm, we, mm. we got tonnage from them and distribution areas that are close to the location where we've got our warehouse. So volunteers have been staying in the warehouse. They've put together a little camping mm. site We're under the roof there. And, and that's where they're sleeping over, some of them in the field, because we transport the food out sometimes several hours from the base, and then they overnight there for three days while they're doing the distribution. And thank God we've got those supplies to be able to give to the people. I was in the camp recently, and it was already 10 days, and the people had not received any food yet. And wow. many of them told me stories of how they'd climbed up in the tree because the water was just rising. Mm. And they climbed in the tree holding children with them. And they were mm. in the tree for seven days, mm. some of them four days, some of them three days before the water subsided. Some of them had family in the tree that couldn't hold on any longer. Of course. And they told their stories of how their, their family member just was suddenly swept away.
Mm. So the trauma that these people go through is absolutely awful. But the love of God and Jesus is Amen. in every one of those places. And he's there to restore. He's there to love. He's there to give them the confidence that he's with them, despite the toughness of what they're wow. going through. Earlier on, you are speaking about the fact that there are certain people who, who are called to go in there and some of us wouldn't be as strong, you know, sure. to sometimes like, you know, see dead bodies around, mm -hmm. see the grief um, of people, be able to be comfort for them. Um, and so I really just believe that, I mean, like I believe in partnership. Absolutely. I believe in partnership and, um, and, and us as TBN, we've partnered with you. Um, mm -hmm. And I know that there are donors as well, you know, yeah. like have sort of come there to, uh, you know, to do the same uh, for you. But once again, I want to stress that the need is dire. You Absolutely. know, for anything. And you know, a partnership enables us to take hands and multiply the effectiveness of what we can do. Mm, Finance mm. is always an enormous need because although we get the food and the donated goods, we've still got to pay for the trucking and the staff and the drivers and the fuel to get it to the people. So finance is always something that we need in those crises. And there are generous people who maybe can't handle the emotion, maybe can't actually go because of time constraints, but they can get behind and they can mm, finance. Mm, so the backup mm. volunteers and the backup donors are absolutely vital. And they're as vital as the hands and feet that are delivering the food. Wow. It's all, it is about partnership. Mm. And the more we can partner, the more we can do together. That's right. One can put a thousand to flight, but two can put 10,000 to flight, you know? There's more power in partnership. Totally. You know, than you know if Peter, you ever try and do Peter things would minister often at our, our leaders' conferences with Jesus Alive. And he'd say, don't ever be intimidated by mm. your church of 200 because there's a pastor sitting next to you who's got a church of 2,000. If you partner and take hands together between you, you're reaching 2,200 people. That's right, which is more than any of you. It's a good way of before. looking at yeah, it. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> and that's what it is because at the end of the day, we are one church. You exactly. know, One is not giving to that ministry, giving to that ministry. You're giving within the church. You exactly. know, we're all giving within the church. Sure. And sure. Um, just what great work. And we are, you know, like at the moment, we're just kind of showing you all the details of how you can, you know, um, get hold of us. And we'll put you through to Jam, how to get hold of Jam um, directly. So, so let's partner together and, you know, to be Jesus to the world. What a wonderful to opportunity. To be Jesus to huh? the world. That's right. <laughs> the more we take hands, the more we That's can do right. together. <laughs> it really is true. That's good. I want to speak about this book. And obviously, and, yeah. and then I've got a few more questions. Death Defying Faith, this is the book by Peter um, Pretorius, um, who's Anne's, you know, like Anne's late husband. Um, tell us about this book, Anne. Well, people begged Peter for years. Yeah. Your stories are incredible. Your experiences throughout three decades of work in Africa, some of the things that you've experienced are beyond imagination, and we want to hear more. Can you please capture it? Please put it in a book. And he never had time, never wow. had time. Eventually, he started transcribing, and my daughter did the transcription, and we worked together as a team. And you know, the amazing thing is it was just three weeks before he passed away oh. that we finished the book. And, and so he saw the book, he saw the cover, he knew the book was going out before he passed on. And it really is a legacy that he's left because he speaks very honestly in the book. You can hear him in every single chapter, how he's experiencing his own personal heart, mm -hmm. what he's going through. He doesn't hide away the struggles. He doesn't hide away the victories. He tells it like it is. And uh. that's, who he, that's who he was. My husband was just one of those amazing pioneers, and I was forever running behind trying to keep up with the progress. Mm, <laughs> but mm. um, he honestly had death-defying faith. Nothing was going to faze him. He was arrested. He was held at gunpoint mm. several times. We were challenged together, held at our gate under gunpoint, in the field, being arrested. Lots of stories in that book where I guess it would have been easy to give up. But that death-defying faith said, no, there's life, and we've got to continue bringing this life. Mm. And so that's the legacy that we're building on now as we that's go amazing. forward. Because that's it's amazing. an amazing foundation. And where can people get this book? They can get the book from our office here in Johannesburg. Yeah. We've got supplies. So they can order that, and you can just put up um, on the screen for the people how to call our office. The telephone number is 548-3900. Five four eight three nine zero zero. Yes, and that's O double one because okay. it's the Johannesburg headquarters. Do not I'll do. Not I'll do right. I'll buy five of these. Oh wonderful. And um and I want, you know, um some well, just write to us and tell us, 
you know, like um, just give us a story of what God has done in your life. Um, say that you saw it on TV and me when I was speaking to Aunt Pretorius. What has touched you about this um, about this episode? And um, I've only got five. So the first five, I will send this book. I've said <laughs> it on TV now. Oh, okay. Wonderful. Yeah, now you're going to do it. <laughs> on TV and so death defying, death defying faith. Every single time I've seen Peter speak, it's always been the most riveting, you know, like riveting and amazing moments. It's like the stories don't even sound true. <laughs> That's how extraordinary they are. And it's like one story after another. I want to chat to you about the Red Bull because the Red Bull has really kind of become the symbol yes. of, um, of, you know, like of jam. Tell I us about the Red Bull. I should have had one in my hand. I know, it's a beautiful the little, little Red Bull. The little Red Bull has yeah. honestly become an icon. It wasn't something that we planned. There was actually a viewer of some of our work over in the US mm -hmm. who saw the children coming with little plastic bags and Coke tins and things like that, burning their hands mm -hmm. as we were serving the food and said, no, 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 I'm not only going to give for feeding, I'm going to give a bowl that's going to work. Wow. And, and this viewer, I wish I could find her, but she designed the bowl that's got a little lip on each side so that the children's, the little baby's hands are protected oh. if any of the porridge the that might be warm yes, would yes, fall yes. onto their hands. Sweet man. And then the bowl has got little lines on the inside demarcating the amount of food according to the age group. So that's how we do the monitoring of the programs within the field, depending on the age of the children. Wow. And we produce the highly nutritious food that's actually a therapeutic food mm -hmm. that gives them 75% of their daily requirement that they have in that one meal. We try and serve it as early as possible. You talk about volunteers. We depend on volunteers. Wow. We've got more than 3,000 volunteers working with us in the feeding programs because we expect the communities to participate with us. Mm, so they mm, volunteer, mm, they do mm. make the fire, they prepare the hot water, boil the water so that any impurities are gone, wow. and then they mix the porridge and serve it, and they wash the bowls and they do the cleanup. What vital work. That's so awesome. that each one of these children gets their bowl of food every single morning at school, so they're getting education with nutrition, good brain development, good opportunity for tomorrow because that's what it's all about. Mm, we have mm. to invest in the generation of tomorrow because they're the ones who are going to continue with the work. They're the ones who are that's going right. to continue reaching out with the gospel, knowing somebody cared for them. Mm. And that's where your viewers are just so vital to it. Somebody cares. Amen. Somebody watching by television can respond immediately and say, I want to be a part. I want to fill X number of bowls. And here in South Africa, just 50 rand a month We'll fill that bowl for a child in one of the informal settlements. Mm. We're working in all nine provinces in South Africa now. So we're expanding dramatically. But the opportunity to change lives can come in this gorgeous little red bowl. Wow, that's amazing. I must tell you, though, I saw a picture because I was on your site. Uh, it was a Jam SA, I think. Yes. Uh, .co .za, and, and, and I saw a picture of a child holding that bowl. <laughs> do, you know that face, uh, do, do you know what that face showed me? Hope. That's that child true. had hope. Yes, there wasn't food inside the bowl as yet, but that child looked on the face. It was written. It was written hope. Absolutely. And I guess more than just the food that you have there, what you're giving them is hope. Exactly. You know what I mean? And yes, I mean, like, you know, maybe you're going to be hungry again in the next five hours, but hope goes far longer than what our stomachs can contain. It sure does. And the little bowl really does mean that to them. And the children love it. They love their bowl. In fact, when we were in Byra with the distribution after this terrible cyclone, I was speaking to the community leader with an interpreter. So the local people standing around in that community were hearing. And these were very hungry people waiting mm, for the mm, food mm, to mm, arrive. Mm, mm. And when I said that we're going to be bringing food, they started shouting out the name of what they call the food that they get. And oh, he wow. laughed and he said, these people know jam. <laughs> wow. And that was so beautiful because they know jam by the little red yes, bowl. Yes, it truly yes. is a bowl that brings hope for the future. Amen. Well, Aunt Jam needs to be known by everyone. And that's why we've brought you on here. Thank um, you. This is the beginning of, uh, of what I believe is going to be a fruitful um, a partnership between, between TBN um, and, um, and, and Jam. Mm -hmm. There's going to be way more, you know, like there'll be way more other projects that we're going to do together because the need is dire. As it we really said is. Before, the need is you know? enormous and the opportunity to partner and be a part of something great is incredible. Oh, we're man. on the ground. We're doing the work. We're reaching out with the gospel. We're reaching out with the humanitarian work. And you know what? We don't want to use a lot of resource to get onto television. That's what you're doing. So yeah. in the partnership, 
we can connect and you can keep doing what you do best and we can keep doing what we do best and the viewers right. can participate in that's both. Right. And that's just such a dynamic force. That's right. And thank you so much. Thank you. For coming on. And um, I also just want to just thank, thank you, the viewers as well, for, um, for, for just keeping us, you know, like keeping us where we are, allowing us to, to help, you know, to be a helping hand to JAM and to many organizations. We are who we are because of our partners and really just because of you. Now, before we leave, we just want to, I just want to show you guys just, um, just a short clip of, um, of what JAM has been doing in Mozambique, in Beira, to show how you, as our viewers and partners, have been involved. From us, good night and God bless. More than 1.8 million people here in Mozambique have been affected by Cyclone Odaya. Jam International has been working on the ground in Mozambique for more than 30 years. We are ensuring that these communities receive much needed aid. Currently, we are assisting more than 100,000 beneficiaries that have been left homeless after Cyclone Odaya to ensure that they receive food and clean drinking water. We are very pleased to be taking hands with TBN to appeal to you to join us in our work to ensure that the communities of Mozambique receive much needed relief during this emergency. We're gonna be on the ground for the next three to six months, ensuring that the communities receive the relief they need so they can rebuild their lives.